I was almost late for this one. I was concentrating on tagging in Walt Taylor at like the 12th of the 11th hour and uh, didn't look at the clock. So here we all are. Um, and Walt, you must be wondering why I've gathered you all here. And that's because sometimes in my, in my fables, in the two books that I wrote over 20 years ago now, there were a couple of characters who would come back through again. You, you get their first story and then in the second book they'd make a little cameo or they'd come back, like the crane from the story of Betty, uh, the storyteller. You know, she was, the crane was in two stories, the first book and the second book. And then the wind is, is kind of constant. You know, the elements are always a constant. But there's one other character who comes back, and that's the one that I always think of, uh, Art. Art is the one, um, and he's my Walt. <laughs> and so he's going to make a comeback tonight. He's going to do a little cameo. So that's Walt, if you're wondering why I've wakened you from your slumbers or taken you away from your sketching, that's why. Oh. One thing I've definitely noticed about these fables is that as I choose them each day, because yeah, I do this like on the fly, just a couple hours before I'm gonna read, I try and pair the selections up and then I practice them. Um, and I realized that a couple of these, I just, never ever ever read in public and these two I have never read in public ever and when I got to the second story it crushed the life out of me because I suddenly recognized that it was a story that I wrote for my husband at the time and that uh, I would write for him again today right now so I have my emergency Kleenex here and I'm wearing no eyeliner just in case because I haven't made it through reading this in practice yet. The second story. First one's an easy one. It's called A Lesson in Speed and uh, we'll see a cameo appearance by a game that I love. So, it came to pass in the land of Africa, in the plains, where the sun rose and set close and hot there lived three animals, a cheetah, an impala, and a warthog. Dusty, the cheetah, had been a wild and adventurous cub. He loved danger and he loved to hunt and chase other animals. Whenever his mother warned him to slow down, he would go faster. Whenever his father told him not to jump from a high branch, Mm -mm. He would quickly climb up to one still higher to make his leap. I know what I am doing, Dusty would call out as he ran or leapt or plunged into a dangerous situation. Dusty had, in fact, been given his name for the cloud of dust he kicked up each time he swept past at his fast pace. That child is an accident waiting to happen, said one lion to another. The monkeys chattered in agreement as Dusty skidded to a stop just inches behind a crocodile. The startled reptile made a dash into the murky waters of the river. Dusty laughed and laughed at his trick. The old lion shook his massive head and called to Dusty. One day, you will find that not every creature will run from you. Dusty sauntered up and stretched his front legs, leaving his back end up in the air, his tail waving to taunt the lion. Dusty knew that while the lion was more powerful, the cheetah could outrun that giant cat. The day has not dawned that left me in the dust, old one, said Dusty smugly. All creatures are the same. They fear my speed and deadly bite. The old lion let out a low rumbling sound that shook the ground underneath Dusty's feet. Lions live in prides, but we do not have so much of it that we do not watch 
where we put our paws. The king of beasts said, you are fast. It's true, but you are not as fearful as you think. This would not be the thought of Tensi, the Impala. Tensi was also a runner, though not to chase, nope, to flee. Whenever there was the slightest sound, a snap of a twig, the rustle of the grass, Tensi sprang away at a full run. It was Tensi's belief mm -hmm, that it was always best to run from your problems. Mm -hmm. He favored saying was, he who runs away today will live to run another day. And then there was Chess, the warthog. He took his time, made his moves with much thought and care. Chess watched every creature around him. He knew how fast was the cheetah, how strong the lion, how nervous the hoofed creatures that stampeded. Chess knew all the patterns of the plains animals. He knew where they went and what they ate and how they hunted and gathered. It was not so much that Chess was strong in body as in mind and spirit. Tensi knew that the large warts that grew on the sides of Chess's face only served to make him ugly, but that in spite of his appearance, he was no threat. In his short life though, Chess had learned that a very great many creatures were afraid of him simply because he was ugly. True, he had those thick and fearsome tusks, but they were of little use if he were attacked from behind, well, say running away, so Chess had chosen to stand and fight. So ugly was he, and so strong in his will, that Chess was seldom challenged. <sighs> well, it's, it's not so much that I believe I, I can win over the beast, he once told Tensi. Mm -mm, no. It's, uh, it's only that, uh, well, I will not live in fear, you see? The days of that African summer had grown long and dry and the watering places few and far between. And so it was that these three very different animals came to be within striking distance of each other. All needed water and the food that either grew by or gravitated to the river. One day, Tensi was standing in a patch of high grass that made him invisible to those who might wish to eat him while Chess stood knee deep wallowing in the mud. Without sound or warning, Dusty burst from behind a bush where he'd been stalking the war warthog that he had chosen to be his lunch. He raced towards Chess. Chess looked up just in time to see the big cat streaking toward him and knowing that he could never hope to outrun Dusty and refusing to give in to fear, Chess stood as still as one of the trees that dotted the plains. At first, Dusty had a broad grin on his face as he launched himself at the warthog. But as he began to close the distance and to realize that the beast was not going to budge, he was confused. This had never happened to him before. He had no idea what to do. Dusty tried to stop before he ran into the beast that looked for all the world like a squat wall of mud. But it was too late. Dusty was going at a full run. And when he reached Chess, he tripped over him and was launched tail over ears, smack into the mud. As Dusty tried to pull himself out of the sticky ooze, he heard the cat calls of the nearby animals. <laughs> oh, look before you leap, cried a female lion. Oh, oh. laughed a hyena. I think it's lunch, snapped the crocodile, sliding from the bank and into the water towards Dusty, who was struggling to free himself from the heavy muck. Fortunately, the young cheetah was able to free himself just before the croc could reach him. Dusty clawed his way to the bank and glared at Chess. Run! 
Dusty said to Chess, run so that I can catch you and eat you. But Chess acted as if he hadn't heard. He just stood still. The cat was becoming absolutely furious. He paced and twitched his muddy tail, and then he came right up to Chess and let out a screaming wail, run! At that sound of that terrible scream, Tensi was so panicked that he burst from his hiding place in the tall grass and did exactly what Dusty demanded. Tensi ran. Now, while a cheetah may not know what to do with a victim that shows no fear, it most certainly knows what to do when it sees a meal racing away. Dusty leapt away from Chess and he began to chase Tensi. The warthog looked up and thought fast of a plan to save his nervous little friend. Circle around the lake! He shouted to Tensi, run, run, run back to me! On any other day, any other day, Dusty would have made an easy meal of Tensi, but the little impala had gotten a good distance away before the chase began, and also the young cat was weighed down by the mud that was caked all over his body. The cheetah was so focused on the chase that he paid no attention to Chess shouting, and he paid even less attention to where the chase was leading him. As he began to tire and slowed, Dusty was surprised to see the little warthog charging out in front of him. Where had that fat, ugly beast come from? Still, the cheetah knew the warthog could not outrun him, so he ignored Chess and he kept after the little impala, and all at once, Dusty felt the impact of the warthog and the pain of one of the great tusks striking at his hind leg. The big cat slammed to the ground and howled in pain and anger. The warthog simply knelt down on his front legs and used his mighty tusks to pin Dusty to the ground. For the first time in his life, the cheetah knew what it meant to respect another creature. Dusty squeezed his eyes shut waiting for the tusks to finish him. But instead, the great beast only leaned down and whispered in the cat's ear. Then he lifted his head and freed the cheetah and walked slowly back to the edge of the river where he was joined by a very grateful Tensi. Dusty sat up and hung his head in shame then he padded slowly into a shady spot by a tree and licked his wounds. So what did the warthog whisper into the ear of the cheetah that made him so tame? Chess told him this. It is neither speed nor fear that kills the fastest. Arrogance comes in on cat feet, unannounced, overtakes us swiftly and leaves us far worse off than when it found us. And then humiliation becomes a fate worse than death. Never again would the cheetah think that faster was better, nor was he tempted to attack another warthog or any other creature that stood its ground. Yeah, it's stand your ground kind of mood today. So, this story, I find that some of these stories are part-time capsule, part-time bomb. I don't know what I was thinking of 20 years ago, or what the universe was thinking when it led me to these stories, but it definitely had a plan to have them all come back like a big old boomerang. And this one I think is a bit about how we speak ourselves into being. We speak our lives into being. And again, it's about perspective. So, not just desert. The desert stretched far and wide. Beneath the hot sun, its sands baked. Few ever visited this place, for it was hard and unforgiving. Why? The desert sands cried out to the cloudless skies. Why am I alone? 
Why have I been so cursed? The hot wind blew across the face of the sand and whispered, you're not alone. Nothing terrible has befallen you. See there? You have some of the most beautiful flowers ever imagined on the earth. Rare blooms of purple, yellow, and white spring from you. These are a wonderful gift, the wind said. But they'll soon fade and die, said the sand. I want more. The sand shifted angrily. Nobody loves me. I'm lonely. I've been given a most horrible and useless fate, the desert complained. The flowers spoke. We love you. We may come and go, but our love for you remains. Sand stirred and grumbled. I don't want your love if you have to come and go. It's too painful to love something that goes. It's too painful to wait for you to return. It's better to stay alone and wait for the perfect love. The wind brushed the sands gently and said, I'm here with you. I love you as does the sun that shines on you with all of its fierce passion. It's the sun's fault that I'm so lifeless and burned out, the sand cried. On the inside, I'm loving, but on the surface, I've become dry and harsh, and, and that's not my fault. The wind blew harder and shouted, don't blame others for your choices. Can you not tell love when you feel it? Can you not see that you could choose to change your surface to match your core, the wind asked. In a fury, the desert sand lashed out at the wind and in so doing created a terrible sandstorm in its violent twisting and wrangling. All of the beautiful flowers were buried. See what you made me do, the desert wailed at the wind. I hate you, I hate you all. Go away, leave me alone. With those words, the desert suddenly got its wish. The sky went dark. The wind vanished, and a terrible and lonesome cold settled. For many days and many nights, the only thing that the desert could see was the moon. Looking at that cold and lonely place, the desert realized that the two of them looked much alike. Please, said the desert to the darkness. I was wrong. It was my fault. I chose to be angry and dissatisfied. I don't wish to be alone. With these words spoken, the desert began to feel something strange. Footsteps. They were the footsteps of a man. When he arrived at the very heart of the desert, he sat down and spoke. Hello, he said. I understand that you have requested to see the sun rise over you once again. The sand shifted with embarrassment. Well, yes, I have, the desert said. I miss it so very much, but who are you? And how do you think you're gonna help me? The man smiled in the darkness. Well, I'm art. I, I paint the sunrise. I must tell you that I, Missed you so terribly these these many days. The desert was amazed. Missed me? You must be mistaken. I am nothing but a broad and empty space. Well, so is the sky until I've done my work, said the painter. I paint all the sunrises of the world from the cities to the mountains. But so many of these places I paint are too busy to notice or too dirty to see the sky properly. But you, you and the sea are the two most perfect settings. Art went on. I paint here with my boldest colors, the most passion. You have strength and openness. Your face changes with the wind and the flowers that grow here are are one of my inspirations. Desert thought about this for a quiet moment. It had been loved in ways it had never known or understood.
I am sorry, the desert said at last. I've been blind to your love and the gifts all around me. Can you forgive me and bring back the sunrise? Ooh. Art patted the sand and nodded. It would be my pleasure. And he set to work and painted the morning sky with streaks of the most vivid colors on the earth. When he was done, the sand glittered in the early morning light, reflecting the colors and glowing with joy. And then art vanished. The wind returned. A mild breeze uncovered the flowers that had been hidden. What do you think of your life now? Asked the wind. Actions speak louder than words, the desert said. I will show you how I feel. The sand swirled and shifted and became a pattern. Standing in the middle of the pattern, it would simply look like a bunch of swirls and angles that made no sense. But when the wind rose above the sand, it came into focus as an intricate and beautiful flower. Just as art paints the skies each day, I will sculpt the sands of which I am made into something of joy, the desert said. And so it was that a place that once seemed dry and unwelcoming became a glorious and peaceful oasis. Okay, I didn't make it all the way to the end of that without boohooing, but that's okay. So, ooh, what would make me all weepy, huh? <sighs> well, when someone you love with all of your heart is so lost to themselves, so unhappy and so lost, all you can hope is that someday they will look up and see the sunrise and know that they belong, know that Man, who said you couldn't make a divorce tougher than following it with a lockdown, right? Woo, okay. So yeah, I do hope and wish the best to a person I loved for so long and that we all have found is absent while present in our lives. If you ever think that the people around you don't love you, I truly urge you to look inward and then look outward. Oh, okay. Well, that was my lockdown meltdown. You guys doing okay? <laughs> I think maybe tomorrow night we're going to need some mermaids. What do you think? Have a good night.